January 18, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson attended the opening days of the Paris Peace Conference. His goal was to make a new world order where secret treaties are no longer the norm. Open covenants openly arrived at. Peace will be guaranteed by the League of Nations. Wilson was going to save the world from itself. While Wilson was still sleeping in his rooms at the Hotel du Prince Mirac, warm, dry, comfortable, on the morning of the 19th, on the other side of the European continent, American soldiers were fighting for their lives in negative 45 degree weather in an undeclared war with Russia at a godforsaken frozen hell called Neogorja. This ill-conceived adventure to guard Allied war supplies was an unmitigated disaster. In Robert Willett's book, Russian Sideshow, America's Undeclared War, he quotes Peyton C. March, Army Chief of Staff, who was against the intervention. The President reversed the recommendations of the War Department to not intervene. Almost immediately after the Siberian and North Russian forces had reached their theaters of operation, events moved rapidly and uniformly in the direction of complete failure. American troops weren't supposed to be engaged in the interior of Russia fighting the Bolos. However, since the day the North American Expeditionary Force landed in Russia, that's exactly what they were doing. On the morning of January 19th, 29-year-old Lieutenant Harry Meade, 4th Platoon, Company A, 339th Infantry Regiment, United States Army, was not thinking about geopolitical strategy that morning. He was trying to save his men from annihilation and get the hell out of Nizhagora. Now, Shenkurs was the location of the British headquarters for this front. The Brits were running the show. It is located on the Varga River. That's a tributary of the Davina River. The main forward area of the front was Visorkara Gora, located on a high hill about 25 miles from the main headquarters. And a thousand yards further south was the village of Ust Padenga. To the left and about a mile further south on to the right was the village of Nizhagorja. These were the outposts of this front. Nizhagorja was such a dangerous position that the white Russian Cossacks refused to man it, claiming it would be impossible to withdraw from, if need be. Lieutenant Meade and the 4th Platoon of Company A were given the job of relieving the 2nd Platoon on January 18th. Meade was aware of the dangers at this forward outpost. Intelligence had estimated there would be a push to take Nizhagora. The enemy had been pushing aggressive patrols out every night to gather intelligence. On the night of January 18th, 19th, the Bolos were sending up flares to guide their assault troops into position for an early morning attack. As dawn broke around 6.30, Lieutenant Meade awoke when an artillery shell landed above his headquarters. He jumped out of bed and rushed to their forward position. He had placed about 20 men in that forward position. It was a small flat field surrounded on three sides by a ravine. The rest of the platoon, 25 men, were positioned in the rear of the village to cover the withdrawal if necessary. The shelling of this forward position in the village continued for about a half hour. The artillery was accurate, methodical, and deadly. The enemy had zeroed in on the communication lines to the rear and the billets for the men. Each shell was on target, taking out one billet after another. After 30 minutes, the shelling stopped. Me and his men saw 1,000 white camouflage bolos coming forward out of the ravine in front of them. The bolos were attacking from three sides. This was not a probe, it was a battalion strength attack. The Americans opened fire on the approaching enemy. Meade said they were sweeping the enemy lines with machine gun and rifle fire. As soon as they stopped one attack, their other flank position was being rushed. Meade realized the futility of holding the village. His men were dropping to the left and right of him, either wounded or dead. He got on the phone to Captain Ojard, Company A's commanding officer, and quickly explained that he was withdrawing from the village because it would be only minutes before they were overrun. Meade and his men needed artillery support to cover their withdrawal. Trying to stem the tide of the attack while Meade organized the withdrawal, Corporal Victor Steyer was keeping the bolos at bay with his machine gun. He was too effective, however. The bolos concentrated their fire on Steyer. He was shot through the jaw. Meade ordered him to dismantle his gun 
and make his way to the rear of the town and join up with the remainder of the platoon. He made it to the company, but he was soon hit again. This time the wound was fatal. By the time Meade had gathered the remainder of his men, the bolos were approaching with fixed bayonets. His line of retreat through the village was cut off. The bolos had taken the village and were sweeping the main street with machine gun and rifle fire. Meade's only choice was to head out behind the houses and sheds. Taking the street was sure death. Meade and his men had to fight their way to the rear of the village. Moving through snow that was waist high was bad enough. But they were also fighting from house to house. The Americans would dash from one house to the next, clearing it of enemy troops. Meade reported that with every other step, another man fell, either dead or wounded. Since each man was fighting for his life, the wounded were left where they fell. The men had no choice. Keep moving or die. Meade and the remainder of his outpost crew made it to the rear of the village. They joined up with the rest of the 4th platoon on a small hill at the edge of the village. The Americans held off the approaching bolos while awaiting for the artillery barrage to begin. They needed that artillery to cover their withdrawal across the valley. Without the barrage, there would be sitting ducks. The bolo machine guns and rifle fire would wipe them out. The Americans fought desperately to hold that small patch of hill. Corporal Diamikas, seeing the bolos coming down the road, ran to a small clearing with his machine gun. Dropping into the snow, he opened fire on them, holding them back. Still, no artillery support. Meade had no choice. They had to get out of there or be slaughtered. He reluctantly gave the order to move out and head to the company's fortified position, about 800 yards across the snow-covered valley. It was their only chance for some of the men to make it out alive. What Meade did not know at that moment was that the white Russian guards who were manning the Allied artillery had abandoned their own guns. They were afraid. Captain Ojard was able to encourage the white Russians back to their post only with the help of his service pistol. But by the time, it was too late. Lieutenant Meade and his men were in the shooting gallery and they were the targets. In the book, The History of the American Expeditionary Force Fighting the Bolsheviks, Joel Moore, Harry Meade, Louis Jans, Meade states, to withdraw, we were compelled to march straight down the side of this hill, across an open valley, some 800 yards or more, into the terrible snow and under direct fire of the enemy. There was no such thing as cover, for the valley of death was a perfectly open plain, waist-deep snow. To run was impossible, to halt was worse. Yet, and so nothing remained but to plunge and flounder through the snow in a mad desperation with a prayer on our lips to gain the edge of our fortified position. For 20 minutes, the men of the 4th platoon worked their way across waist-deep snow while being shot at from their rear and from the snipers in the woods on both flanks. It was pure luck or chance or divine intervention that a man did not get shot. One by one they fell. Wounded or dead didn't matter. The temperature was still negative 45 degrees. If a man fell wounded, he would soon be dead due to the extreme cold. The others had to keep going. As they made their way across the valley, Corporal Diamikas stopped, set up his machine gun, most likely knowing what he was about to do meant certain death, but he did it anyways. He wanted to give his comrades a fighting chance to survive. Diamikas didn't even get his gun up before he was fatally wounded. Even in this valley of death, there was a sense of camaraderie. Sergeant Kernan saw Diamikas go down. He could have kept going, trying to get to safety, but he didn't. Thinking Diamikas was only wounded, Kernan went over to help him. As he crushed over Diamikas' lifeless body, he too was badly wounded. But after what seemed like ages, the remains of 4th platoon made it into the fortified company position at Visokaya Gora. Of the 47 men who woke up in Niagara that morning, only seven made it uninjured to the company position. The heroism, the heroism that day was not over. Lieutenant McPhail, unwilling to leave any man behind, told Captain Ojad that he and five men were going out to pick up the wounded and dead. Captain Ojad didn't oppose those orders. Lieutenant McPhail, Sergeants Trombley, Ness, Rapp, 
Private Kuna and Molly Judd of the 337th Ambulance Company took a sled and went into the slaughter pen to retrieve the wounded, who otherwise would have died. They miraculously made it back to the American lines without being wounded or killed. There was another rescue party that went out later in the day. All told, 4th Platoon had lost 25 dead or missing, 12 wounded, and 3 shell shock cases. There were two men on the missing list who showed up two days later. Their story was amazing. In the sudden confusion of the early morning attack, Corporal Burbridge and Private Waringa were cut off and had to hide in the closet of one of the houses. Knowing they'd be found quickly by the bolos who had overrun the village, Burbridge and Weingar had their rifles and bayonets ready. They were determined to make it out alive. The closet door opened. Burbridge lunged at the first bolo with his bayonet, then pulled it out and shot the second man. He then kicked the lantern over, plunging him into darkness in the house so they could make their escape out of a window. The bolos tried to give chase, but Burbridge and Waring Gardner made it to the woods. The enemy let them go, figuring they would die of exposure. The two men spent the next two days and nights in the forest, making their way back to the American lines. By the time they reached safety, both men were frostbit, both arms and legs, but they were alive and safe for the time being. The Bolos were making a major push for Shrinkhurst. Lieutenant Meade and his seven surviving men would have a brief respite before the whole company made a fighting retreat. Lieutenant Meade made it back home to Michigan. He practiced law as well as entering politics. He had a successful career in both professions and passed away peacefully in 1969 at the age of 79. If you like this video, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and thank you for watching.